Welcome back to the Curate for Women Network. Today we are sitting with the most phenomenal photographer, Miss Sasha. Hello, Sasha. Hello, Victoria. Thank you for saying yes to me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for doing this, because you're really like a ghost. Like a lot of people are like, uh, you get to show us what she looks like. I'm like, <laughs> yes. This is Sasha of Green Tangerine Photography. She is one of Louisiana's most favorite family photographers. I'm gonna actually start this episode just a little bit different than what yeah. I do most of them because it is January and obviously a lot of people have like New Year's resolutions. Mm -hmm. What is a goal that you have for yourself this year? Mm -hmm. And is there anything that's stopping you from meeting that goal? Uh, yeah, so one of my goals this year was to be more intentional about taking time for myself um and just living a life of more abundance outside of uh, creating for other people um and no there's nothing stopping me um but my own self <laughs> so, and so your own self meaning like i've already how filled up my books you, yeah yes <laughs> yeah why do you do that um uh, yeah i have uh i the intent is for to live the life of abundance outside of creating for other people but maybe creating for myself but I continue to have the issue with saying no sometimes to repeat clients and you know wanting to please and accommodate and accommodate yeah um do you think that your clients will understand though if you just decide like okay yeah i know i say yes to this but either we're gonna push this back or yeah absolutely i have really understanding clients i feel like there's a lot of grace let my way and i appreciate it for that so why this? How did you get into photography? Um, so I never aspired to be a photographer. I didn't have a dream of it. It really fell into my lap, truly. Um, it was like, a, I think I was looking for a creative outlet. And when I had my son, um, I found a lot of joy in capturing him. And then that literally snowballed into other people asking me to take pictures for them. And when I started learning about the craft, it felt like something that I could attain and I could do. And that's where I found my talent in that. And I found joy in it. Because you're an artist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is an art, but then outside of this, do you do any other type of art? Do you yeah. indulge in like music or? So, um, I mean, I enjoy music, um, but I, I also enjoy like decorating and organizing. I love home decor. I love aesthetically pleasing things. I love symmetry. And all of that falls within the realm of photography too. Like if, you know, symmetry and things like that. So yeah, so outside of photography, I'm also always looking at other art to learn and create. Mm -hmm. um, the studio is beautiful. Thank you. And the way that you organize everything in here, like by color, by things, by design. Like I, I love everything Thank you. in here. Creating a space that feels... Um, comfortable and clean and open for me it makes me work a lot better I feel how long have you been doing this 10 years 10 yeah. years yeah. wow and, uh, that's crazy I think I met you 10 years ago yeah we probably did wow yeah. that is crazy and to see how much you've grown but the crazy thing is is like we watch we're able to watch people's growth over the years who's like whose work has been in the spotlight because mm -hmm. your work has been in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. You've been awarded a lot of times, but mm -hmm. you have not right. been in the spotlight. Like yeah. I said, you are a total ghost. Yeah. And I prefer not to be. I think that the work should speak for itself. Oh, your work definitely speaks for itself. Well, if you can scroll down a page or on the internet and you can see an image and you know who that image belongs to, then to me that's, it shouldn't have to be my face or my name, right. you know? It's crazy because I was saying all that to say, like, I met you 10 years ago, but I've also, I also watched your work 10 years ago and I would have, I had no clue that you were just starting because your work was already so good. And I didn't feel that way about it, but I was affirmed so loudly from the outside mm -hmm. that it helped me dig more and gain confidence to continue mm -hmm. without those types of affirmations i don't know that i would have yeah so hearing things like that helped me grow and when i look back at my work from 10 years ago i cringe a little bit because i'm like oh i didn't know you know but nobody told me that yeah you know but that's good that you can look at your work from 10 years ago and cringe and still be proud of yeah. like what you're doing today because yeah. if you're still doing this 10 years from now you'll also look at this work now and yeah. it's going to be cringy yeah um, only because of how far you've grown. Because right. I've also seen like a lot of photographers in this space that's doing what you're doing and 
um, this is no like judgment to them, but you can always tell when people stop educating themselves. Oh yeah, on their craft. Always a student. Because it's not evolved. Because no. their work is not evolving. No. Oh, uh, yes. That's yeah. true. Yeah. But always a student. And I believe that. I've learned from everywhere. I learned from kids. I learned from my clients. I learned from other people. I learned from people. Even I love learning from people who are just starting out because they have this open mind and they're moldable mm -hmm. and malleable. Whereas sometimes prof professionals are like, oh, I know everything that mm -hmm. there is to know. I don't know everything there is to know. I still take classes. If I find that there's someone who knows better than me, I want to know what you know, you know. And so especially, you know, if I can go and and sit and learn from you, always a student. I love that. And yeah. I wonder if these people who are posting these classes even know what kind of students they have, especially mm -hmm. when they have a student like you. I don't even want them to know that. I just, just act like I don't know anything. Teach me. Because I feel like sometimes it gets a little bit intimidating if you mm -hmm. have like your peer, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, I don't want them to know that. But yeah, so. That would be do, nice. you, do you ever still have like those feelings of like imposter syndrome doing this? <sighs> Occasionally, but no, not really. Because if you're coming to me, for a service, it's because I know what I'm doing mm -hmm. and you're paying me for the service or, or you're acquiring my services. And I just have to have that confidence to go in it and know that I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm still here for a reason. And you're still growing. Yeah. And I'm still growing. Yeah. Yeah. This is not stagnant. Green mm -hmm. Tangerine is not stagnant. No. We've yeah, moved up a lot. Who is your favorite photographer? Like, who do you look to or who did you look to okay. to model? Yes the things when you got into this? So the person that I aspired, I, whose work I, inspired me the most was is a woman named Danielle Finney. Danielle Finney is uh, from the DMV and she was a black woman and her colors were so vibrant. Her pictures were so crisp and clear. I would literally obsess and I would just look at these pictures all the time. And then one time she offered a class like, hey, come learn from me. Baby, I booked that flight so fast. I couldn't get to, <laughs> to DC fast enough and I brought me and my friend Shigeri, we went up there together and we were just learning. And I just said, that's what I want my images to look like. Absolutely. And we're friends now, Danielle and I, to this day. Oh, cool. Yeah. So are you guys like, are you in a space where you're able to learn from each other? I think that we are in a space where we're able to learn from each other. I actually just got, had a, a some Toronto photographers reach out to ask to, they want to teach a class here. And they're saying, can you lend us your space to teach a class? And so that's wonderful to have people all around the world to say, hey, you know, I know your work. I know I your love I, it. Yes. Can we come there and and work together? Yes. Yeah. I also love that you said that you didn't aspire to be this. It just kind of happened mm -hmm. like haphazardly. You had mm -hmm. a kid. You love photographing your kid because who doesn't think that they have the most gorgeous right. kid? Yeah. I mean, you do have the most gorgeous kid. And I'd imagine Sorry. that taking <laughs> pictures of him was like super fun to do. Yeah. But then as you started to transition into like what you are right now, mm -hmm. When people initially started asking you to do that for them, what was, I mean, what was that like? What did you say? I was say? terrified. I said, well, I have no idea what I'm doing. Right. You want me to do, I was like, okay, I'll do it. But please just know this. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I would just be that transparent. Like, I'm just starting out. I'm doing this. I have this camera. Here we go. And so there was a lot of times where I felt like the images were like, oh, they're going to hate them. And the parents would be like, oh, I love them so much. And I was like, hey great. You know, I, I was relieved. And yeah. a lot of times that was what kept me going because mm -hmm. even though I would be hypercritical of the work, the client would be very happy. Mm -hmm. You know. Do you still have those moments sometimes where you're like editing pictures and you're like, oh my gosh, this could absolutely. be way better. This client is going to yes, hate this. Yes, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> I'm like, this is not Do my best work. Do you ever get those clients? Nope, never. Okay. I didn't think so. No. I'm like, this is, I'm thinking in my head, like, this is not my best work. I could have done better. I could have done this better. I could have done this better. But I'm glad for that criticism for within myself because then I learn for the next time. Oh, for sure. Um, but when I deliver, it's nothing but like, the, thank you so much. And they're grateful. It's something about artists and creators. It's like, as soon as you get comfortable with your craft, that's when people stop appreciating mm, it. But like, yes. when you start, to, and, and honestly, it's like being in this space, though you don't want to be people pleasing in the sense of like doing what people tell you to do, but you mm. have to be people pleasing in the sense of giving them a product that you and them, you know, you and they could be proud of. I was talking to someone the other day and they affirmed me and my work and my business because I, I posted something about like, you know, having a small business. And then she was like, your business isn't small. I said, well, it's just me. And she said, and she affirmed me in such a way that I said, I don't hear this very often because I think once you reach a certain level, people feel like you don't need to be affirmed. Mm -hmm. We still need affirmations. because sure. Yeah, because we're constantly so growing and evolving and like looking at our work and 
criticizing it. And so that means a lot when I hear those types of things. I just think that women, when you work behind the scenes, when you're mm -hmm. doing the things that, like I said, like people can see your work, right? And your work does speak for you. But sometimes I think that they could appreciate it more when they finally get to meet the person. Yeah. Like I think it is so beautiful that you've been doing this for 10 years and there's still so many people that's like, I don't even know what that person looks like. Yeah. I don't know if it's a woman. I don't know if it's a man. Yeah. I don't know if it's a white woman. I don't know if it's a black woman. Yeah. You know, you are, to my knowledge, the only black female photographer that does the type of work that you do, the newborn mm -hmm. shoots in the style that you do it, yes. the maternity shoots and the family shoots. Yes. How does that, that has to feel like so much pressure for you. It, it, and the way that it feels like pressure for me is that I cannot accept everyone. That's mm -hmm. the only way that it feels like pressure for me. I love doing what I get to do. It's I, There was a market for it. It's a niche. I, it t took a lot of learning and intense, like, preparation and learning about baby anatomy and their spines and their heads and safety precautions. But now that I know it, it's excellent and I love it. But the only reason that it feels like a lot of pressure is because I cannot take everybody. There's so many babies born every month. And at some point I just have to say no. Yeah. And I think you won't make time for you. Yeah. And I do have a referral list and I do send them. I'm not going to just leave them hanging like, sorry, right. I can't accept you and your baby. Good mm -hmm. luck. <laughs> I have, you know, I, but I have a referral list because I want everybody to be able to have that, even if it can't be with me. Right. When you started and people started reaching out like, oh, my gosh, you take these pictures. Mm. Da, da, da. How did you set up pricing for that? So I underpriced myself for a long time because out of fear, like I didn't deserve to make this rate. I didn't deserve it. And then I sat down with someone and they said, well, are you going to do this for a living? How are you going to live off of this? And I was like, I have no idea. So then uh, gradually, and then, you know, you look at the market, you look at the medium income where you live, you look at your cost of doing business, you do all of this and you're realizing like, you know, and then when I raised her prices, it was like, wow, well, she's so high, you know, she, she's really high. Like, I'm not going to go to her, you know, and I would hear the whispers about my prices being too expensive. That didn't bother me though, because I it's knew that I would deliver the quality at the end of the day, people just want what they, they pay for and they're happy when they get it. Correct. So being able to price myself maybe out of certain people who didn't appreciate the work and into the clientele who do mm -hmm. and want the legacy of having timeless photos forever was exactly what I needed to do when I raised, when I raised my prices. When you are paying for services that are sometimes not a tangible thing. Yes. It's hard for people to appreciate stuff and, like and that. And here's the thing, and I'm not, I don't shame anyone who can't make the investment. I understand. Mm -hmm. As long as you're documenting your family, whether it be it's with me or on your iPhone or whatever the case may be, I'm happy for that. Mm -hmm. I understand if you can't make the investment, the truth is, is that I have to make a living as well. That part. And so I, I appreciate anybody who inquires with me. And if I don't hear back from them, I don't take it personally. At the end of the day, I'm a business to them. They're seeking out a service. Right. And I'm okay with that. I don't think it's too high either. You know? <laughs> and in fact, I have some clients who are like, when are you going to raise your prices? Because you need to go up. And I haven't raised them in a few years. Okay. Well, let me get up in here before you do it again. I'm okay. just kidding. Put you on that schedule. I know. Get on the schedule right now. How fast did your schedule, uh, how fast do you book your schedule? I recommend people booking six to eight months in advance. I recommend that if you're pregnant. If you're pregnant right now. So typically I know that my clients are pregnant before their family because they will tell me so they can book before they even hit the second trimester. And I zip my lips. I don't tell anybody. Smart. Yes, I'm very quiet. I never, ever divulge that information and they feel trustworthy enough to do that. So, but I, they want to get a spot. So then they, they book. So I think that's a good. So I say six to months, six to eight Child, months. Yeah. You got to be very responsible to book with you. Just, you know, I just had it. It's January. I just had some book for Christmas. <laughs> I said, finally, people are getting it. This is what I need. I need okay, you guys when to they not reach out, reach to out you. in October for Christmas pictures. Right. When they You're reach late. out to you in enough time, enough times and know like, dang, even a month out, mm -hmm. I can't get mm -hmm. a session. First, that is beautiful. But it's not me being any kind of way, but I do have to separate Business and personal, right? I have to have time for myself and I have to have a couple of days off. Well, this, I'll say this. After nine years, I'm finally taking two days off. I only took one day off for nine years wow. because I was growing and my business. And that one day was still probably like editing yes. and stuff too, well, huh? Yeah, I, was, I would try to be intentional about not doing any work, but sometimes it happens. But now that I can 
I have a little bit more uh, leeway and grace in the number of inquiries I get, I'm able to have two days off. And that's nice. Thank God for two <laughs> days off. Because you know what? It's so crazy to us when people are like, thank God it's Friday. And we'd be like, I don't like, feel that way about Friday. Friday mean? Because no. Friday means that work is just yes. starting for us. Yes, exactly. I feel the same way. I feel that, I feel that way about Sundays. People don't like Sundays because they're like, Monday's coming, but Monday's my day off, and I love it. Love everybody's it. gone, everybody's at work, everybody's at school, mm -hmm. and I can just do what I want. We typically love Sundays, too, because nobody's trying to film on Sundays. Mm -hmm. Nobody's even trying to work on Sundays. Sundays are a lovely yeah, day. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Sundays is a lovely day. Yeah. Uh, Friday is typically when my headache starts because I'm like, dang, this is usually the time where people could get out, they could have yes. fun, and all these things, but I'm like... I just expressed to my sister that Friday felt so lonely for me. Mm -hmm. I don't like Fridays that much. Everybody's loving Friday because they're getting ready to make their weekend plans. And I know I'm going to be at work on Saturday. Yeah. yeah. Because for... Because <laughs> everybody's at work exactly. during the week. Yes. And so every Saturdays book up. I, I'm booked out until July or August for Saturdays right now. That is because insane. Because I don't... Everybody wants a Saturday and I'm closed on Sundays and Mondays. So that Saturday is the only weekend that I have to offer. And I book five, or up to five sessions on Saturdays. Do y'all hear this? Because I know after <laughs> seeing this episode, a lot of y'all are going to want to like hit her up. If and depending when Saturday. it comes out, you might not. It might have to wait till 2024. You have to, <laughs> depending on when this comes out. Y'all still going to watch this in January. So first of all, high five. Because that's beautiful. Thanks, Congratulations. You. you started this business because of your son. Yes. Obviously. Do you ever tell your son thank you? I haven't, but I need to because he was a major inspiration for me. For this, and not even just because he was the first subject that I had, but because my son was diagnosed with autism when he was two, and I recognized that I needed more time for him, mm -hmm. and there was no way that I was going to get that time doing what I was doing. Prior to this, I worked in mental behavior health. It's a very important job. It needs to be done, but it was so draining, and as an empathetic person, I just knew that it wasn't my life's work. Yeah. And so... I said, well, what, how can I change this? How can I, I was missing things. I was missing school plays. I was missing all of the important things. And how can I change that? Creating um, a life and a career for myself in which I can spread my time out between my family and my clients was really important. And so he's inspired me for that as well so that I could be there more for him and his needs. And he's 15 now. So, I mean, he's far from the baby who I was taking photos of, but he was my first subject. And Does and he I'm still allow you to take pictures of him? It's getting harder and harder. It's <laughs> getting harder and harder. It's I take a picture for him for his birthday every year, every okay. single year. So I'm able to watch him grow. And when this is year birthday? was uh, January 4th. It just passed. Oh, yeah. it's, good. This year was tough to get anything. He's got this mustache now. Oh. He doesn't want to be bothered. So it's, yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's a grown up. Yeah, he's a, he's a big oh, boy. Oh man, not a must. Okay, so tell me, how was that raising a, a kid with autism? You're a first time yeah. mom. Yep. And you received this diagnosis. Did you? Were you the one who inquired that this may yes. be an issue? Yeah. I, um. So he's my only child. I didn't. I felt like he was missing milestones, but I didn't really know what to look for. Yeah. This is something that I, is so important. You don't know what to look for if you've never done it before. But I did know that there was something different. And I knew that. I said, hey, he's not talking. He should be saying something now. What's happening? And people would brush it off down here. they say, oh, babies talk when they want to talk. That didn't sit right in my spirit. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I'm going to take him over here, and we're going to see about this. How can, mm -hmm. how can we see about this? Took him to uh, early steps. They, they couldn't diagnose him, but they could make a referral to a neurologist, in which they did. And she's the one who diagnosed him with autism. Mm -hmm. And that was the easiest part. The hardest part was finding resources. This is before. Uh, ABA behavioral therapy was even covered under any type of insurance. We were paying mm -hmm. $500 an hour for therapy because there was one ABA therapist in the entire Southeast region. And she knew she could monopolize it because this was before, again, insurance or Medicaid paid for it because it was an alternative therapy. $500 an hour. Yes. How often did you have to do it? So she, when she would come, it would be $500 for her and she would send a student during the week. And the student was not licensed in anything, but she was, you know, and we paid her $80 an hour. And then you're desperate at this point. Oh, absolutely. I'm like... And we had, thankfully, thank God we had the resources because what do you do? You want your kid to have the best level of care and the best quality of life. So yeah. um, it was really hard at first. It started to get a little bit easier as autism became more widely known and accepted. Yeah. And they started creating resources for pe people with autism. So we got him into this school, and the school was excellent. What school did he go to? He goes to Hope Academy. In Baton he still Rouge. goes there. Yes. 
and they small classroom sizes most of the children that have exceptionalities all of the kids in his class have autism and they learn from each other they're the kindest most gentle kids if he's sick and he leaves when he comes oh Kevin we missed you so much and I just love that I love that for him Mm -hmm. I love that for them. Having a community with people who see you and yes. appreciate you no matter what. Also, what I'll say is that like uh, I, the doctors are great and everything, but I take what they say with a grain of salt. They're actually not raising kids with autism. They're just no. diagnosing kids with autism. Correct. My best, the best people that I have are is my in my community are other parents of children with on the spectrum, because we get to talk about our experiences. And I have yes. a friend now who has a son who's younger than us and she's like I'm really struggling with this what did you do and I'm like here's how I can help you yeah. here's the resources that I can offer you because I have the oldest kid with autism I love that you said that I take what the doctor says with a grain of salt yes we put so much trust in doctors not first of all not even realizing that they're practicing medicine yeah. right they're constantly researching and at a certain point they feel like they know so much no. when you see it so often you become so immune to Absolutely. it that you're handing out these diagnoses without actually understanding what it's like to be in this position, mm -hmm. um, how, how to live with a kid with these diagnoses. And it's a spectrum disorder, so you could fall anywhere on it. Yeah. And there, that's why it's hard to give advice because where my son sleeps and eats fine, there may be a child with gastrointestinal issues right. or sleeping issues, and that's not something I've ever had to deal with, so it's hard for me to say or I can just make a suggestion like here, this is what I've heard based on the community I've been in. Yes. Let me lend a hand or let me let me let you talk to this other person who's dealing with the same thing. Yes, okay. because we have. a So my my son is mm -hmm. um, he's on the spectrum. We don't fully know where as far as like his learning abilities, because he was born completely blind, but with. Um, disorders that causes mental delays, mm -hmm. right? And we were desperate to find help. We were reaching out to so many people. We were trying to find groups that we can be in on Facebook where yeah. we can like find other people who are dealing with what we're dealing with. But what he had was like one in 10,000 people had it, yeah. right? It was bananas. And we're one in 50. And, so it's kind of easier for us to find, yeah. Right, but it's also like to have a friend like you mm -hmm. Um, who has an older kid with autism, it's like, oh, well, now I see that this is hard right now, yes. right? It never gets yes. easy, yes. but I see that my child is going to be fine. Because yes. you also don't see that. Yes. You never, ever see like what is like beyond your young baby Absolutely. that you're struggling with, and you can't find the resources nor the community. And now you have basically like, you've guinea pig this thing. It's, it's inspiring. And I, yes. a friend of mine just told me, she said, I look up to you guys because my son is seven. Your son is 15. You've reached this milestone. Yes. I see that he's able to do all of his activities of daily living on his own. He's able to shower, dress, cook, you know, these things. Yeah. And I have hope now for my son. Yes. And so it's almost like a sense of relief in, in a spirit of a parent who's been desperate. Yes. You know, out here in the streets is tough. Okay, yeah. so you are you're you're married, but not to your son's father. Right. So, my son's father and I co-parent seamlessly. We have a great relationship. Um, we laugh. We kiki on the phone. We have a great <laughs> relationship. Um, he's a good guy. I am married. I have a wife. Um, she is amazing, and she came into our lives at the perfect time where she's an educator, and mm -hmm. she was able to help Gavin, my son, navigate some things that I was struggling to help him with. So we really step into our roles. Mm -hmm. She's the educator, she's the homework person. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna set the doctor's appointments. I'll do that part, I'll fill out the paperwork. But when it comes to homework and things like that, she comes in and she really took charge and has changed both of our lives for the better. Oh, mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Do you feel like since you've been married or since you've met your wife mm -hmm. that your life has elevated in every way? I feel like my life has elevated in many ways mm -hmm. since I met my wife. Um, we both have our strengths and we lean into each other for each of our strengths. Um, and as far as my profession goes, this was my own thing mm -hmm. that I carried and mm -hmm. the confidence, the level of confidence that I had as a person was boosted because of my craft and what I know that I know how to do. And I think that that was attractive to her and I was attracted to her because of what she wanted to do and how she just went and got it. I'm very attracted to people who have a lot of drive, and she did. So she says, I want to be a basketball coach. I want to be a teacher. I'm going to do things. And she did those things. 
And how long have y'all been together? We will be married three years next month. And we've been together for seven years. What was that transition like for your son mm -hmm. when you married a woman? Is that even a thing? Like, does he even look no. at that and think like... No. Um, that the one thing that I really love about Gavin is that um, he's not... He doesn't ask a lot of questions about things. I think that if he trusts someone and he knows that they're around and they're kind to him, <clears throat> he he doesn't have any issues. So he didn't ask any questions about it. He wasn't like, you know, who is this person living with us? He just knew that Kim was around. His, his dad is still always around. He's We're always all together. We're a village. Mm -hmm. We support and lift Gavin up all together. They have a great relationship. We have a great relationship. And it works. And, I love it. And, but these kids need that a village no matter what who it is right you know so no there was no it was a seamless transition honestly are you really close to your family we all live in different states everybody um it's hard to i mean in proximity no but relationship wise yeah were they supportive of when you decided uh i love this woman yeah i'm gonna marry her we're yeah. raising a family together yes. because we we live in america yes right and you are a black queer yeah woman who's a creative yeah. like people will really try to discount what your family Absolutely. means yeah. and so how did how did your family how did your family um embrace so what i'll say is this i have the boldest fiercest most intelligent sister who tr blazed trailblazed this path that i did not have to do any hard work because she did all of the hard work for us for me. Your sister is also queer. My sister's queer, yes. And she did the hard work years ago in high school where one thing that was so important to us was to change the narrative and the thinking of the our family as far as like homophobia, transphobia, and all of these other phobias went. And the way we did it was that like, this is, this is the lives that we live. You can be a part of it or you cannot be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And you being a part of it means you looking at your bigotry, looking at how you think and possibly when working on changing those things and then understanding the lives that we live are our own. Mm -hmm. And they have beautifully transitioned into loving, open-armed people. We go there, it's no problem, there's no issues. I actually just popped up married. I didn't tell anybody <laughs> I was getting married and they'd never really seen me like date people or bring many people home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, well, this is my wife. Um, everybody meet Kim. <laughs> what did and they say? I, the thing is, is that I think for me, it's like I knew my wife would be palatable and I hate to use that word, but what I mean is my, she's educated, mm -hmm. master's degree. She's a basketball coach of so sports for my mm -hmm. dad, you know, and things like that. So I knew that about her. And so I wasn't so worried. Yeah. And so my dad asked my mom, she said, she likes girl. she said my mom said she likes who she likes right right and she was like you know and so that was it there was no more questions right there's nothing to talk she about she likes who she likes mm -hmm. i love that yeah because clearly you can't make a baby with another woman i mean right. you can now science has gotten very yeah. very advanced i mean you know it, it, a lot of things are possible a lot of things are, <laughs> it, it, a lot of things are possible now and thankfully yeah. there have been people who have you made the way for that to happen but you know no there's no issues in my family we we we've, we've really helped them to grow and yeah. i feel like with the older generations you have to either and there are people that we have cut off yeah. You know, there are there are people in our lives that we decided that we don't want it to allow ourselves to be affected by your lack of change and open mindedness. And so Correct. we're just not going to be a part of your life either. That is a huge like I say it's a huge sacrifice, but it's mm -hmm. one that you have to make if you really want to truly live a life that you yes. desire, one that you could be proud of, mm -hmm. um, because nobody else has to live this life for you. Nope. And the life that we want to live is a life of joy and abundance. Yeah. Abundance. Yeah. And, um, and intention. And so if, for, in order for that to happen, we create this, I have a lot of chosen family, mm -hmm. you know, I Same. have family, but I have a lot of chosen family, Same. especially living in a, a space where I don't have, I'm not in proximity to my actual biological family, biological family. Mm -hmm. Then we have these people who are in our lives who are like, yes, this is, you're my family. Yes. You know, they look at my son as nephew. They look at me as sister, and it's a beautiful thing. Do you, do you journal? No. No? Not at all? No. I have many journals. There's nothing in them. 
Oh, you one of those people that like buy journals, yes. collect them. I do. They look nice. Yeah. I have journals. I have notebooks. I'm like, yes, I'm a like, fresh girl, paper. I'm like, girl, if I look up in here, this is like the perfect place. I journal a lot. If I can't get to a piece of paper, I'm journaling on my like. What are you? What are you saying to your journal? It depends. Oh. It depends on how I'm feeling. I'm just curious about what people journal, like Moesha journaling, like. No, it's funny because when I started journaling, it was it was very Moesha like. Now it is. I feel like journaling just helps me to be a little bit more emotionally intelligent, right? Yes. Because I do feel like I take a lot of things personally, initially, and so when I'm journaling through it, it gives me an outlet to just talk about something without actually having to bring my issues to somebody else. Okay. Because though I could be a very open person, I right. feel like I always say that vulnerability is my superpower, but vulnerability is my superpower once I figure out who's safe enough to have these conversations Absolutely. with. Yeah. And then also being able to decipher if some of this stuff should even be said out loud. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> sometimes I could have thoughts that can be selfish. Mm -hmm. Honestly, like if I'm, I can be offended by something that somebody did that would honestly be a boundary of mine. Mm. Um, but if I journal through it, it allows me to save a lot of relationships. Yes. It allows me to process things. Even though my husband is my, is, you know, he's one of my best friends. So, but we work together. Yeah. So if we're already dealing with a lot of the same stuff, it's like, if I come dump too much yeah. on you. Who do you vent to about your husband? My journal. Mm -hmm. Because, because marriage. Some that's necessary sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't have a safe space okay. for who I've been to about my husband. Mm -hmm. Also, because we're always together, mm -hmm. and I'm like, you know, your friends could take things so personal. Absolutely, they don't forgive well, right? Mm -mm. Family either. Oh, I so. definitely. I. D yeah. And I can say this boldly. Yeah. They know that you. We ain't talking about my That's baby right. daddy, okay? I just love him too much. I think um, I love him too much in a way that I know that nobody else, especially if they're not married, they don't fully understand it. Mm -hmm. Now, I have friends who we would laugh mm -hmm. about our husbands too. And sometimes if you work with us, you're just going to see it, right. right? Sometimes we ain't friendly with yeah. each other. <laughs> and that's okay. But yeah, so all of that is... In my journal. Okay. Yeah, I'm not a journaler. Um, I so think who do you vent to? My sister. Oh. oh. Uh, so for those who don't know, I'm a twin. Yes. Um, for my, those who don't know, I found out today. Yeah, today. <laughs> yeah. So um, my twin sister is my, I think that if everybody in this world were gone and she was still here, I would be okay. Mm. That Ow. includes my child. Wow. <laughs> because of, and it's, I'm serious, and people may look at that crazy, but the connection that you have when you're a twin mm -hmm. and you spend every day in this, every day, including the day you were born, up until we're 38 now, we've mm -hmm. spent 38 years together as each other's confidants. Does she live here? She lives in Brooklyn. Oh, wow. She graduated from LSU, and like uh, two weeks later, she moved and never came back. And so your sister understands a part of you that nobody does. Yes. Right. But she checks me, and she's like, I think you need to look inward for that. I think you need to process that a little bit more before you say it. She's like, she says, Sasha, sometimes you just say things that's not nice. And I'm like, it doesn't feel not nice to me, but you're right. Maybe I do need to think about how somebody else is going to receive it. I'll just ask a question like, what happened to your side tooth? You know, or something like that. You know, just uh, just not trying to be mean, but just like what I'm Curious. curious to know. Like, yeah. why are so many people missing their side tooth? You know, like yeah. what's going on with that? You know, but she'd be like, Sasha, did you have to ask that question? I'd be like, I'm Chanel. I'm just trying to figure out. I want to like kind of get a consensus over mm -hmm. like, you know. Mm -hmm. Is uh, she the more mature one out of you two? Um, or I guess it depends on. She'll say so. <laughs> she'll say she is. I'll say she, you know, she teaches me a lot. Okay. My sister is a distinguished lecturer at CUNY. She is an activist and has been for twenty over 20 years. What is she teaching? So she teaches gender studies. Um, she just took this position, but she's been the comms director for the Movement for Black Lives for the last several years and before that for Black Lives Matter. Oh, I love that. And so her activism started at LSU when she was doing the hate versus heritage uh the LSU was had the Confederate flag and LSU mm -hmm. colors, and she was she chartered buses for all the black students to go to Gina, Louisiana. Remember the Gina Six? Yes. Um, she did all of those things, and she was just very in rooted in her convictions for liberation for black people, yes. and we both are, and for access for women as yes. as well. So, um, 
So yeah, she's she's moved mountains for wow. years. Yeah. Okay, your sister's like a superhero in my eyes. Truly. Like in my I would eyes too. love, love, in love my eyes too. to meet her. I admire her so much. And I, I tell anybody I can, I can I'll tell about my sister. You know, yeah. and I think she does the same for me. One time she was in the airport and somewhere and so I was like, Oh, you t you do green tender photography. They thought that she was me. And then one time I was in DC in the airport, they go, Chanel and I go, Nope, Sasha. Well, it's so crazy because I always knew that you had a sister and I would always see pictures of your your sister and mm -hmm. I'm like their genes are strong. <laughs> like, it is almost scary how yeah. much y'all look like, okay, but now it's not scary anymore because no, I know that y'all are twins. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I always thought that you were like the youngest of we the have, people, uh, we but y'all are... Two, two younger siblings but after us, so. Ooh. Yeah, we have a brother. And... Twins raising, were you guys like at helping to raise your younger siblings or were y'all just too we close We were a age? little bit estranged from our brother because he lived in a different household from us. Okay. So he lived with our dad and we lived with our mom. Okay. Yeah. And then my dad had another kid and she's 19. Did your parents co-parent well? No. They didn't. We so where did you learn that from? Or uh, is it easy? And this may be super ignorant for me to even have this thought. So correct me if it is. But do you think it's easier for your kid's dad to co-parent with you because you have a wife? I feel like women are easier to just deal Maybe, with. Maybe, but what I'll say is I I think the emotional maturity that he and I both have mm -hmm. and us knowing we have, we're lifers. That's what we, and you guys are too, yeah. right? In, mm -hmm. in, in the way if you have a child who you may have to care for for the entirety of their life. Yeah. And um, is that we know that we have to a respect each other's time and respect each other's relationships. And we mm -hmm. do both of those things. Mm -hmm. I have a very mature wife in which, you know, Gavin's dad is a lot, can come over our house and hang out, sit on the couch. He came for Thanksgiving and we're looking for him. He's sleeping in Gavin's bed. It's, he, <laughs> he ate, got the itis and went to sleep. But you know, it's not a big deal. Yeah. We're all family at the end of the day and it's yeah. all for the benefit of this child. Yeah. And so, um, so maybe, maybe it is. Maybe y'all should teach a parenting class. I There's think, a lot of us who haven't figured that out. I do think that what you have to do is, again, we're both entrepreneurs, so my time is my own. We have a schedule. We created it ourselves. There was no courts involved. There was no judge. Mm -hmm. And it's been the same way for 13 that years. That is such a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. And when he's sick, you know, you I don't believe in willful ignorance. Yeah. You know the doctor's number. You know the dentist's number. Don't call me. Yeah, call them. Call them. Make the appointment and let me know what's going on and vice versa, you know. And I'll be making all the appointments on his week, you know. Uh, Did you learn that from your sister who teach gender roles? No, there was no gender, gender roles. Studies. There's none of that. Yeah, because you're don't not about to just that. assign me no. to doctor's appointments. Because it's emotional and, labor. Yeah. So if you're saying, hey, should I, does Gavin have a dentist appointment? You, you should know whether or not he has a dentist appointment. <laughs> and he does. He doesn't, he does not put that on me. Yeah. And if I send him the appointment and he's, he's taking them, I say, well, he gives me an update and that's that. We're not playing this where you don't, we act like you don't know what to do. Yeah. You're the dad, I'm the mom. We know we equally know how to raise our kids. Correct. And so we're not we're not playing those types of games. Correct. So no. Especially now because Because it does put emotional labor on the top of my head when I think I have to carry all of this on me. Why? Mm. We're not allowing it. Yeah. You know, and I I encourage other people, and particularly women, not to allow that. Yeah. He knows how to do it. Let yeah. him, he, do you know what I'm saying? You know, so we're not we're acting yeah, like that. that. Yeah. Having a family, coming from a broken home mm -hmm. is, for lack of better words, yeah. that's what we call it when our parents divorce and mm -hmm. live in separate households. Yes, we did. Um, being raised by parents who did not figure that out, right? Who did not figure out how no. to co-parent well. How did that affect your relationship or how you view marriage mm. growing up? Um, that's a good question. So we lived, when my mom remarried, we moved across the country. I'm from Los Angeles. At the age of 13, we moved to Ohio. Oh, God. Um, How is that? At 13? Okay, so you're just getting into your teenage yeah, years, yeah. and you go from, like, yes. what most people would view the best place yeah. on earth to live to, to Ohio. To rural Ohio, too. We were two of six black kids in our school. Were you upset? Um, yes, we had a really hard transition. We really did. It's it, it, my, my stepfather, I don't call him stepfather, I call him dad, but... He, he worked in the automobile industry. He was a mechanical engineer. He worked for a Ford Motor Company, and that's what took us to Ohio. Okay. And, but that, that shift, although I didn't like it, set us up for a life of abundance because we then learned how to work harder. We then learned about educating ourselves. We learned mm -hmm. so many skills from him and from that 
that we would have not had had my mom just raised us. I mean, I'm sorry, no no shade to my mom, but the opportunities that we were afforded because of that situation yeah. were better. My mom was able to go back to school and get dual master's degrees. Yeah. And, you know, just set up I a mean, better life for no us. I mean, that's no shade to your mom. Because yeah. who, I mean, your mom did right. She yes. picked right. And yeah. that's, I feel like a lot of people, they mess up families and in, in, in their children because they have a bad picker. Yeah. <laughs> like, Agreed. pick somebody yeah. who can really help you raise your yes. children if indeed it doesn't work out with the person that and you have planned that. to do she life did with. That. And they've been married for 30 years now. I love uh, yeah. that. And so you call him dad. So he was a very instrumental being. Since we were three years being. old. Okay. Yeah, he was always there. Okay. And um, even, even when my biological dad wasn't, you know. And so I know that I can look to him for guidance. I trust him completely. If I ask him for something, I know it's going to be done. And so my mom, she did make a sacrifice for us. And yeah. Um, so how is your relationship now with your biological dad? It is, um, I accept for who he is now. Okay. And that's the best that I can say. Yeah. Yeah. I love him. He's a, he's a, um, he's grown a lot, mm -hmm. but I just accept him for who he is. I got you. Yeah. And so your siblings, how is that? The siblings that you didn't grow up with, how is your relationship great. with them? We have, I have a great relationship with my brother. That's good. We, we weren't, he wasn't in the, he was in the house with us for a while and then he wasn't. Mm -hmm. So we lived in Ohio and he lived in California and that was really hard for all of us. But Oh, is that your mom's son? Yeah. My, oh, okay. So my, I have my twin sister and my brother. Okay. And then Jaden is our little sister and that's my dad's daughter and she's 19. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. She's and a we're 38. baby, baby. We were 18 when she was born. Yeah. You could have raised her. Yes. And she's wonderful. She teaches me so much. She is so assertive. She will go into Louis Vuitton. She'll be like, I want the shoe. And actually, I don't want it like this. I want it like this. Can you guys? And she just asserts herself so well. And it is inspiring. Is she an artist as well? She's an artist. I love she it. She loves decor. She creates things. She actually got into Parsons School of Fashion in Manhattan. Congratulations, at the new school. sister. And she, yeah, she's, uh, she's, she's brilliant too. Yeah. Oh, I love it. So we do have a good relationship with my brother. It was, it, for 10 years we didn't talk. Mm -hmm. Did they stay in California? Yeah, they all stayed in California. What part of LA? Yeah. Oh. Do you ever wish to go back to LA? I go, I'll go back often to visit, but I would never go back to live. Okay. Yeah, I, I like the country life. Yeah. This okay. is the country for me, I don't care. People can say Baton Rouge is the city. Oh no, I'm from Baton Rouge, yeah. it is definitely the it's country. The, and I like it, it's slower, I like a slow life. Yes, it's the country, but it's also like a good hybrid. Of it is like, a good hybrid. It kind of. You could get that city vibe when you want it, but then, for the most part, you I live in the like, country. I do like being able to pull up into my driveway. Oh, now, I'm from L.A., baby. Parking is scarce. <laughs> so you might drive around three or four blocks to find a parking spot. I like having my own washer and dryer. Yes. I like being able to have to afford my own home. Yes. Um, wow, these are things that you don't even think about when nope. you grow up in the South. Mm -mm. Because... Yeah, or even grocery shopping or anything, finding a parking spot, those types of things. I mean, it's ridiculous. When you go to the Costco in Brooklyn or in L.A., it's it's packed. It's, it's a madhouse. I can't know? even imagine what a Costco would look like mm -mm. in L.A. Mm -mm. Well, fun. whenever we travel to cities like that, we always stay downtown because we want to be in walking distance. Because driving out there, yeah. no LA thank is you. Not a, L.A. is not a um, walkable city. It's if you want to see everything, you do have to drive. Yeah. But there's also not transportation like there is in New York. So like my sister was just telling me that she bought a car with 25,000 miles on it six years ago and now it has 52,000 miles on it. And that's how little she drives. Child, I will write that up in a year. A year. Easy. <laughs> easy. So, but she takes, she walks and she takes the bus and I mean, Because we going to drive to New Orleans at least a couple times a yeah. week. Right, on a good week. One thing I do love about Baton Rouge is in proximity to a larger city, yeah. that's a magical place to me. Yeah. I mean, I fell in love with this place. I came to visit, and I moved here six months later. You are the first person. Because I love Baton Rouge. Yeah. I'm also from here. I wasn't born here, but I was raised in Baton Rouge. You're the first person that I know that came here, visited, fell in love, and said, everybody gets trapped by a job, and then they're like, I left. I'm, I'm I was intentional about coming here. I said, I'm going to move there. But my great-grandmother was born in Lake Providence, Louisiana. And so I feel like it's in my wow. blood, it's in my bones, it's in my roots yeah. to be from the South. A lot of us are from yes. here. But during the migration, you go to Chicago, you went to New York, you went to L.A. Yeah. And that's how we ended up being from L.A. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So never ever to live there again. Did Wouldn't your sister not. ever talk about wanting to move back to L.A.? Yeah, absolutely. She's looking at property. She feels a very sense of belonging at home in LA. But she's now tenured at CUNY, so she'll be there for like the next seven years, so we'll see. But yeah, no, my, I, I, but I, I've been trying to get my family to move here 
I know that might sound crazy, but I want them to have things. I want them yeah. to own property. I want yeah. them to have land. Yeah. In LA, that's not attainable. I know. And Baton Rouge is, is growing in such a good way. And it's a developing city. And yeah. now it's it's popular to be black. So people yeah. aren't running away from I like know. selling you stuff. Also, I've been very interested in looking at these compounds, like buying acres. And then, okay, you live in your part of the, the uh, compound. Hey, take a golf cart and come oh, to my funny. house. My husband's family is talking about that. He has a sister that is like very, she is serious on. We're going to build a compound and the Armstrongs mm-hmm. are going to live there. I love it. Most people run from their in-laws. I love my in-laws. I could totally live on a compound I with them. I love my in-laws. Yeah. <laughs> they live in Mississippi. My wife is from Mississippi, but they're beautiful people. They're mm-hmm. just from the country. They got one stoplight and I talk. Whenever something really country or like ass backwards happens, I'll be like, oh, they got to be from Mississippi. I, know. <laughs> I talk shit about it to my wife all the time. She's like, really? And I'm like, she's like, but you love me. And I'm like, I do love me a country girl. Right. But Mississippi, you couldn't pay me to live in Mississippi. Sure. Sorry, people from Mississippi. I love the people that I know from Mississippi, but yeah. the city, it's, the state itself and like the little small towns there are so not progressive. They're not. I'm like, in Louisiana... We're still not progressive, but we're getting there, yes. right? You can find little pockets of like communities Absolutely. of like very diverse communities of people who don't look like you, but they still accept you. Since I moved here in 2005, I've seen Baton Rouge progress a lot. Yes. Yes, this city has has gone so far. I mm-hmm. love Baton Rouge. I yeah. wanted to leave. Ross kept saying, you know, because I kept leaving. I'm like, there's no opportunity here. He's like, you're going to create your own opportunity here. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> and the, I'll tell you what, I agree with what Ross said because... When I had my son, I felt like uh, I'm almost trapped. Mm-hmm. Like I, I didn't come here to necessarily stay forever. And then I felt really sad that I couldn't leave. And then mm-hmm. I said, well, what are you going to do about it, Sasha? Yeah. And, and look what you did about it, and Sasha. And that's it. That's what. I, there's a bubble. I, ha- I live in this bubble where I have my work, my, my studio, my home, my wife, my son, and mm-hmm. my chosen friends and family. And it feels so beautiful mm-hmm. and nice and abundant to have that. And look what you did about it, Sasha. Look what you did yeah. in Baton Rouge. You have people from all around the world wanting to come here to meet you, to learn from you, to be your subject. To Baton Rouge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Girl, people are running away from Baton Rouge. Uh-huh. Nobody wants to be in this. And you've created such a really good space, um, such a safe space because of you know, for a lot of people who who haven't had the opportunity to be photographed by you, they don't even understand what a silo it is mm. here. Like, what a beautiful, calming space it is. It mm. smells good in here. Yeah. It's very light yeah. in here. Yeah. I just want to live here. <laughs> yeah, I find that when people are in a space where they feel comfortable, they feel more comfortable taking getting their pictures taken. Mm-hmm. And then I create a relationship and curate Mm -hmm. a relationship with my clients in which I get to watch their children and families grow by a child a year or for the last eight years. I've had clients for nine years who I've every year I've got to see their children grow and that that means a lot to me. You know you were the first person to take a picture of me where I actually looked at it at first glance and loved it. I am so not photogenic. Mm. I hate taking pictures. Um, I hate being photographed, but we, you did our, um, our pictures for my, when I was pregnant with Cece and yeah. then you did Cece's baby pictures. Um, and they were beautiful. Like that was the first time I ever saw a picture of myself and was like, oh, she did this. Oh, you guys have such a beautiful family. Like, ah, Cece was so, thank you. such a chunk. I, mean, I know. She was a big girl. I know. Oh man, you should meet her now. She is... <laughs> That sweet little baby that slept through her entire session mm. now gets up yelling my name. <laughs> she literally does, Sasha. She wakes up and she's like, Mama? Mama? <laughs> and then if I'm like, sometimes I'll sit there for like 10 minutes before I answer her. Mm-hmm. And then she yells at me. And then if she knows that her daddy's home, she's like, Daddy? Mama? Like basically it's like telling you. want to raise fierce, bold daughters. Yes. But then they be fierce and bold to us. And we're like, who are you talking to? But you want them to be fierce and bold in this world. Oh, I love Cece's personality. It is just scary to me because I'm like, not everybody is going to embrace this as she gets older, they right? They don't have to. They don't have to, but as a mom, it's still scary. Because mm-hmm. I remember encountering so many people who wanted to dumb down my very vibrant personality mm-hmm. to the point where it made me feel like I was too extra. Like right. I was just doing too much. Um, and so while she's walking around being spunky and being mm-hmm. like that part of herself, I love it. Now, when she's being that person who's like throwing herself out and catching fits because she can't get what she wants, I'm like, 
Mm-hmm. It'll pass. There's still a belt waiting for you, yeah. little girl. Yeah. She never felt a belt before, but she done felt this a little tap tap. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have never used a belt on Gavin. I don't. I don't spank him. We never whooped him. It's, I think that's something that was uh, in my family. My sister, well, my sister doesn't have any children. My brother. We decided that we weren't gonna hit our kids because we did get whoopings and it wasn't helpful. Yeah. And like, so, what did that do? <laughs> Uh, and we just used to find other ways to be sneaky. So, <laughs> like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, but also, like, I just don't believe in hitting people who can't defend themselves because it truly, I, if you, if I do something, you know, like, you can't hit me. Right, you, right. I, I'm going to send your ass to jail, right. you know? But a child who's defenseless, then we're just hitting them and they don't learn. What I thought it was doing was then teaching that child that if they didn't get something they wanted, they could hit somebody else. They could hit, they somebody, could hit else. somebody else. You know, I actually think about this sometimes because I am a parent who pop pops. Now, Rossi has yeah. never gotten a belt. But also, if you know Rossi, he's also not the kid that really warrants that. Mm-hmm. And neither was Jaden. Now, Rossi, Jaden, Jaden was, Jaden is our oldest son. Um, and he set us up for failure because he, he made one. us believe that all children acted in this way, mm-hmm. especially because he's my bonus baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and so coming from somebody who's already skeptical of having kids in the first place, I was like, oh, if kids act like this, easy peasy. But they don't. Yeah. They don't. Gavin's been great. And we, I stopped there. Yeah. <laughs> You're not about to trick me into having a because you already know it don't it does not even work like mm-hmm. this you already know that kids don't come here well behaved and so Cece came here and showed us mm-hmm. very much so that no kids don't act like this okay how do you care for yourself on a bad day mm, good question so slow mo- learning how to get up and be slow in the morning is such a treat for me mm-hmm. um, when I can get up and be slow in the morning meaning I don't have to jump up and rush and get things done. When Gavin was younger and he would have hard days with his autism, I would literally just drop him at school and come back home and go to sleep. But I, that wasn't productive or conducive to, you know, anything for myself, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of rest, but now journaling is not my jam, but what I do do is I like projects again. So I plan out projects at my house. I work on things around the house. I clean, having a clean, space that's nice is great for me getting caught up on work I know that might sound crazy but as long as if I'm not behind that feels Mm -hmm. wonderful to me Mm -hmm. um marking things off my checklist feels great to me Mm -hmm. and now recently planning trips and and traveling has been something I'm really into because I said I started this business to have more time for myself and I actually work more now than I ever have but now I'm able to say, look at my calendar and say, hey, I'm going to take these eight days off. I'm going to take a month off. I'm going to take this time off and do th- things that I want to do. And now making core memories and spending time with my friends and being social. I mm-hmm. decompress by being social. I'm a talker. I love to be social. My wife is not. We're very different in that way. She's not a social person. She's very That's guarded. That's interesting that you're so social, mm-hmm. but... A lot of people don't even know. know you. You I'm are social with ghost. the people who I want to be social with. What yeah, I was telling okay. you before was like, I I spend time with whom I want to spend time yes. with, and if that is not is not mutually beneficial in the way that we find joy in one each other's in each other's company, mm-hmm. then I don't see the point of that. Yeah. So I am social with the people I want to be social with. But you're right. I do keep my business and my personal life very separate. Mm-hmm. I actually have separate social media accounts for everything, <laughs> and. Sometimes, you know, clients will, will filter in a little bit into my personal life and it's because I allow it. Yeah. Because I've created then a friendship out of that client mm-hmm. and then I learned to trust that A, um, they are open and understanding of my life, mm-hmm. which is me being a queer black woman of color mm-hmm. who has a disabled son and I want that to be something that is like, there's no questions. We're yeah. not going to, you know. Yeah. Um, and so then. So but I do keep things very separate and that's intentional. Yeah. I do believe that if you want to create a large following, you have to be intentional about what you put out there. Yeah. And, it, and for it to be organic. So yeah. I don't put my dinner or the things I did on my my professional page. People follow me because they want to see pictures of babies and Correct. other things. So that's what I put. I put that Because you also lose your following. You if do. Then you start straying away from what people want to see you? from you. What, what, was it, what was the purpose of me following you? I love your pictures. Yeah. And then if I start entering and putting in things that have nothing to do with that, yeah. I don't find that that helps. So I keep yeah. it separate. And yeah. that makes it easier for me as well. 
That's a good nugget for entrepreneurs. I, yeah, I do. I give that. I do. I, I tell, because I teach photography as well. So when mm-hmm. I teach my mentees, I tell them, keep keep it separate, you know? And if you can't, at least let it be, a, let it align, yeah. you know? Because the thing is, is that like, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes people won't hire you because of your personal things and yes. oh, whatever. I mean, yes. that's fine. But if you're really needing the business yeah. and you're just starting out, you might want to maintain that professional look if you can you know? yeah I am totally I love keeping everything separate mm-hmm. we have a we have a film agency called fourth floor our personal life is nowhere on there mm-hmm. to people who don't know I, and I say this too like we're such mostly Ross he's such an enigma right like you think you know him but mm-hmm. then you don't um, and most of your connection with him is through his work. Mm-hmm. And I love that. And that's what I adore about you. And honestly, I'm just drawn to people like that. Like, Well, Ross kept, Ross, <laughs> Ross would text me and be like, when are we, Sasha, when are you coming over for dinner? I know. Ross would text me, no, faithfully, like, when are you and your wife going to come over for dinner? Mm-hmm. When are we going to see you guys? And it felt like just from the one, when we very first met speaking on the panel for Sam Ross's, what Sam Ross's panel, um, after that, Ross was like, when are we going to see each other again? And it was like, you know, and that made me feel good. And I felt a genuine connection here. Mm -hmm. Cause when he loves you, he loves you. And let me tell you, we do, we, it's like a a big inner circle. Mm -hmm. Um, and people are always confused about who's closest to us. And I don't even know if that's intentional. Um, I think that, I think that, and I said this earlier, like God just, he he honors your true intention. Mm. Um, and so when we find people who really just kind of match our lifestyle in a sense of the things that we cherish, the things that we honor, it doesn't mm. matter that your life doesn't look like ours. That's right. Right? Um, but you have the same, you just, it's like we mesh so well. It's like a kindred. Yes. Yes. We met you and you were like instant family. Yep. Even the very first conversation, you sent me that picture the other day when I was doing your yeah. henna. That's my old life, guys. Yeah. Um, when I was doing <laughs> your henna tattoo, and I remember that conversation. I made your henna tattoo bigger just so that our conversation could last longer. Because yeah. it was like instant family. Yeah. What does retirement look like for you? So I'm very diligent about putting um, aside what I need for retirement. The one thing that I think about is Gavin and what his life will look like. So um, I don't know that I'll do this forever. I think that I really love teaching photography. And so maybe I will pivot into a educator role Mm -hmm. and less physical manual shooting. Um, So we'll see. But it looks more like getting back to where when I used to take my camera wherever I went and take pictures of anything. Mm -hmm. I don't do that anymore. Yes. When I'm done with clients, I put it away and it stays there until my next session. And I don't take as many photos of just the things that I enjoy. Um, Because once it was became my occupation and my career and not my hobby, Mm -hmm. it changed for sure. It does do that. Yeah. That happens. Yeah. I think that's a good entrepreneur nugget to yeah. know that if you turn your hobby yes. into your career, you yes. still have to find ways to love it. Yes. Because um, you definitely don't want that to turn into work. Right. Your clients feel that. I, yeah. I feel that your clients definitely feel like when you're overwhelmed um, or you're starting to get into a season where you're burnt out and then they're just... I think the hardest thing is having to perform when you're not you don't have the bandwidth to perform, yeah. but you have to perform. For each client, that's their own personal experience. For me, I may have four clients a day, yeah. and so you're my third or you're my fourth, yes. and maybe I'm not feeling well, or maybe you know I had a challenging or emotional night or mm-hmm. whatever the case may be, or maybe Gavin had a tough morning, but I still have to come and perform for each client as if and start over immediately. They leave, the next one's walking in, and I have to take a deep breath. Maybe I didn't even get a sip of water. I probably didn't even eat lunch, mm-hmm. but the next person, I still have to provide that energy for them, even if I don't have it. And performing for other people is really tough sometimes. And as an artist, having to put work out and perform 
in that way and create for other people in that way is it can definitely sometimes be exhausting. Yeah, it could definitely be exhausting and you can get burnt out very mm -hmm. easy. So, yes, I think that that is a good idea to figure out a way to get back to um, taking things, taking pictures of things that you yeah. want to take pictures of. Um, so as you're traveling and as you're doing all these things, are you taking your camera with you? Mm -mm. Do it. Nope, I don't. I don't take it with me anymore. I leave all of my gear at home. I got like the latest iPhone. I'm like, I'm just gonna take my phone with me. And I mean, but uh, you're a photographer. I'm sure. I'm sure that you can make the pictures on your yeah, yeah, camera yeah. look like. Yeah, I mean, I do. What and, Apple makes them look like. And 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 that's. And I'm okay with that because okay. you know what? Everything does not need to be documented. Okay. I do. What one, another thing that my disc has taught me is that everything doesn't need to be documented. Mm -hmm. When I see the moon and it is just showing off and it's looking so fine and so beautiful and so abundant, and I'm like, God, that moon is gorgeous. Let me go take a picture. And it looks like this. And I cannot prove to anybody else in the world that the moon, I'm like, so I have to tell people, go outside and look at the moon because yeah. that, the moon has taught me a lot in the way that everything is not meant to be captured. Or you also everything is not for everybody. For yourself. Yeah. And everything I don't think is for everybody. Yeah. Um, I think that when, when sometimes when we're traveling and we're out and we're doing things and I'm like, social media will get you caught up in Absolutely. wanting to prove to people that you live such a great life. Yep. And I, ha I definitely got into a place where I'm like, I barely, I always forget to document what we do because mm. we're having such a good time. But aren't you happy to be present and be there and enjoy it? <sighs> Just be here. And I don't have any regret that I didn't take a photo because I actually have the the joy in my heart and my body and the abundance that came from there. that. Because you were there. Because I was there. And it, it's just so much of this. That, the brain is very malleable. What I know from filters, and I've seen this shift in the last 10 years, filters, Instagram, the brain is so malleable that it make it, people actually think they look like what they look with, with the filter on. So then when it makes my job harder because then they're like, well, I look like this when I take it with my iPhone. Hmm. <laughs> Let me explain exactly how that works. So if you're doing this, that is different than me doing this. Mm -hmm. And then there's no filter that's changing the shape of your nose and your mouth and your eyes because that's what filters are doing and that you've convinced yourself. Because that if you, you go back like to this. someone's, let's just say you go to, to someone's Facebook profile picture. I, I challenge you to scroll as far back as you can to see when the last photo they had without a filter on it. Because once that starts happening and in your mind you start convincing yourself that you that look you this look way. Like that. You don't want to go back. It has made our job a lot t more challenging. This is how you look. This is what we look like. Oh, man. And I think for some people, it's hard for them to see that. And sometimes it's hard for me to see. Sometimes it's hard for me to see. Ross showed me this still of myself before we got started. I'm like, is that what I look like right now? <laughs> and uh, my wife is, is that what you're wearing? I said, this is what I wear to work. Yes. This is my uh, authentic self on a work day. You know, I'm comfortable. And I'm up and down off the and ground. And I actually think you look really nice. Thanks. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I mean, no, this is just, uh, you know, so the it, it is what it is. And one thing I've learned from doing this job is I look how I look. And if I don't like how I look, then I have to either change it or accept it. Yeah. And the so, more comfortable, yeah. the better, though. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like when people are able to show up here and curate very comfortable, the conversations, they flow so much easier. But you're looking at yourself way harder than anybody else is. Whatever you're thinking, other people are thinking, they're not thinking about you like that. And if they're thinking about you like that, so what? But most of the time, they're not thinking about you like that. Yeah. People think uh, that other people are really looking at these little things that we are critical about ourselves. Really, other people are not Now, that's pressed. something that I should think about all the time. Yes. When I go back and watch these curated episodes, I watch them one time and I am done. Don't I'm watch like, it. I won't watch it. I don't know if I'll watch this. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have to watch this. What do you mean? You Maybe, don't know if you can watch sometimes it. Sometimes I literally be like, oh my God. I know. It took me a while to get past the fact that, and I still don't like the way that I sound. I still, there's certain ways that I hold my mouth when mm -hmm. I'm listening to people talk and I'm like, fix your mouth, stupid. Yeah. And so, like, so, sometimes I'm like, even now while we're talking, yeah. I'm like consciously trying to, like, but just as a reminder, close my you're mouth. probably the only person seeing those things. I don't think that anybody watch, goes on the YouTube channel and is like, look at her mouth. Why is she holding it like that? I, See, I just did it again. Just as a Some people do. But yeah. you know what? Here's how I started this. And this, this should really be a thing for people to pay attention to. I grew up with three brothers, which means... I actually grew up with like 10, mm -hmm. right? Because all of their friends became my brothers. <laughs> One of their friends became my husband. Um, but they were so hard on me. They were like, girl, you are ugly. <laughs> like, I'm telling you, they ripped me to shreds. 
And even like we were adults and we were having a conversation and I was talking to my brother, talking with some of my friends and my brother just so happened to be present for the conversation. He's like, when did you become funny? And I was like, boy, forget you. Yeah. Like, I've always been funny. Yeah. You can appreciate the fact that I was slightly a comedian yeah. because you were always dragging me. And you right? probably are more funny because you had to be quick with them for coming at you. That's why most people appreciate me yeah. because they're like, wow, you really do act like a dude. Yeah. I do. Well, I try not to anymore because, you know, I'm around a lot of women and they want to be around women. Yes. <laughs> But I am very much so like a dude. But I really, do, I do know that most of my close friends, all mm. of my close friends, appreciate that I am the way that I am because I grew grew up around so many guys. Um, but I think that their harsh criticism kind of humbled me in a lot of ways. Um, whereas if I did grow up listening to people call me pretty all the time and you're mm -hmm. so, if people talk to me like how my husband talks to me when I was growing up, I would have had a head mm -hmm. this big. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Same. I have thoroughly enjoyed my time with you. Same. Thank you so much for saying yes. I have seen your schedule. It is way more ghetto than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're on the same page. I've met a lot of photographers, sure. female photographers, mm -hmm. black girls, young black girls mm -hmm. who are aspiring to do what you do. What mm -hmm. is some advice that you would give them as they pursue a career like yours? Sure. Yeah. So I was just talking to um, your niece Monroe, who's an aspiring photographer, and something that popped up in my head was that, you know, as professionals, one thing I'll say is to be slow to call yourself a professional. Revel yes, in doing the due diligence. Revel in learning because the minute you raise the bar to the professional, you can never lower it, ever. And people notice that. So if you're just the cool girl with the camera who takes great photos, be that cool girl for years. Who cares? You don't have to call yourself a professional. You can just take amazing photos and people are going to look like, wow, she takes great pictures. But you, you know, just be slow to get to that point because then the pressure is on and it stays there and you can't lower the bar, you know, and the minute you put out a bad photo, then people are talking about you, you know? So, but if you're not at that point, you know, then don't. And also just always be a student. Always be a student. Always be prepared to learn. You can learn from anybody. You can learn from anywhere, any experience and, and delve and dip yourself into those experiences, you know? So... Yeah, that's a... That's... Don't be so quick to call yourself a professional. That's yeah. a cheat code. And that's also some really, really, really good advice. Yeah. I wish I would have waited longer to say I'm a professional photographer. I wish I was just the cool girl with the camera. Because... Well, 10 years ago, I did not know that you were just starting off because mm. I can't remember a time that your work was not good in real life. That's very kind. <laughs> it's also very true. I can show you. <laughs> I well, have I'm the sure as a creative now, I could probably look back and say, wow, you have come a long way. But at the time, uh, yes. you know, especially when you, you, I definitely did not know what to expect from photography. I thought that that was just. And this kind of work, what I'll say, working with the newborns is new, it's not for the faint of heart, but this is a very special niche that I've really whittled down what I choose to create yes i've whittled down what i choose to accept yes here's what i enjoy doing and here's what i'm going to do and here's what i'm not going to do but that comes with time and the the affordability of having so many clients want to pursue your you as a service provider that i can say no to things now mm -hmm. i love that part of this <laughs> i love the part of this that i get to say hey I actually don't provide this type of service and you know i'm not starving yes Yes. So that's nice. I love that. Yeah. And I love you. And I love you. And I'm so grateful. Me too. I'm grateful for our friendship. Thank you. I'm grateful for everything that you do for black women. I'm so grateful for what you do for creatives in this space and just showing young girls what's possible for them. Absolutely. Um, and then it's also inspiring to know that you're still growing. Yep. Always. So, Thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you for being here. If you have anything that you want to say to Miss Sasha, drop it in the chat. And as always, like, follow, subscribe, and share this with all of your girlfriends and all the guys that are out there watching as well. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye.